Let's talk about places uh, in the ocean, in the coastal zone. Um, so a lot of these terms are, or a lot of these descriptions might be uh, new to you. So I want to make sure we just uh, take a, a few moments here and run through some of the place names and the descriptors for these things that we might be referring to the rest of the semester. And so rather than go through every single possible uh, geological feature or anything like that, I, I want to focus on management re relevant um, geography. So things that influence how we might manage fisheries or how we might mine the bottom of the ocean or, or that kind of stuff. And so um, as we go through, uh, you know, if anything is confusing, a lot of these terms are, are maybe unusual. So make sure you stop me and ask me any questions you might have about them. Okay, so we'll start with this. So, yeah, you heard that a lot in the wake of 9-11, which was, oceans no longer separate us. They haven't separated us in a long time. So that was a bit strange um, in terms of uh, someone thinking that the world was still separated by oceans. Um, but nevertheless, that, that sort of old perception uh, has dominated. So one of the key themes here I want to make sure we talk about are the geographies of land, which is mostly what we're used to. Most of our classes talk about this. Most of our life experience is about this. And so we're going to spend most of the time today talking about geographies of the sea, just because that's the newest um, stuff for, for most of us. Okay. So let me turn the lights down so it's a little bit clearer here. So tell me about, uh, tell me about this. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, the Los Angeles Basin. Yep, totally. Um, and this is not a map. I mean, I mean, there's some names on here, but this is not a map. This is just simply um, a NASA satellite that has a very sensitive light sensor that's pointing down. And we can see almost the whole of the geography just based on the light, right? Knowing nothing about the units or the whatever. And, and we can see streets, we can see transportation corridors, all that kind of stuff. Most of our terrestrial realm, when we talk about geography and talk about um, uh, uh, units and things like that, most of it is coming from a political or legal construct, whether we acknowledge that or not. So when we look at here, we see streets that are defined by uh, management decisions. We see counties, we see ports and, and that kind of stuff. Um, also, much of our terrestrial um, geography and, and orientation and things like that is built on our long history of being a terrestrial species, right? So we have a lot of legacy here. This is uh, Santa Barbara, essentially downtown Santa Barbara um, in the late 1800s. And you can see already, right, we've, we've begun to uh, divide up and, and create different management units and areas based on streets and, and, and uh, where we are relative to rivers and things of that nature. Currently, a lot of our management um, conundrums or challenging issues derive from a legal jurisdiction. So this, the pink thing that I'm showing you, is our so-called jurisdictional wetlands. At least they were before the Supreme Court changed the definition of wetlands and decided we wanted to get rid of 50% of the wetlands in our country, but that's another conversation for another class. Um, and so, so in any event, this is the, this is, this is the jurisdictional definition of what a wetland is, and therefore what is a, a legally, federally recognized um, uh, type of landscape, um, at least before the last uh, year or so. Um, and this is what we've used for planning, for example, in Ventura County. So uh, a legal definition as to if it's in area A or in area B. And from that, for example, that was the main backbone for our, our um, first ever in the nation groundbreaking uh, uh, wildlife corridor policy in our county, um, which is meant to try to connect fragmented areas such as the Santa Monica Mountains with the Simi Hills and other, other places. Um, again, what we're looking at is there's chunks that are 
in green are, are color A and things that are in color B. So we've legally defined an area to be within um, some criteria that we care about in an area outside. And then uh, another example here, which is a little more relevant to our coastal zone stuff, this is a term you might not have heard yet. This term comes from the Coastal Act. So this is um, a term that is only really relevant in our, coast, in our legally defined coastal zone in the state of California. And this is so-called ESHA. Nobody says the full name, everybody just pronounces the acronym ESHA, which are environmentally sensitive habitat areas. And so that's what I'm showing you with this, this uh, uh, overlay here. And so ESHA, which is um, a type of geography, a type of area, is defined in the Coastal Act as uh, an area which, in which plant or animal life or their habitats are either rare or especially valuable because of their special nature or role in an ecosystem and which could be easily disturbed or degraded by human activities and development. So here we have um, a, a management uh, geography that's um, enacted because we're worried about losing it or, or the implications for doing something in there to other things, for biodiversity, for economics, for, for something. Okay. Questions about that? Make sense? That should all be pretty straightforward. This should sound familiar to us. Okay, so in contrast, in very stark contrast, we have what goes on in the oceanic realm. Whereas we have all of this tradition, all of this legacy, all this political history and everything that, that, that um, tell us if this is, uh, uh, if, if the name applies to this mountaintop or doesn't apply to this mountaintop. When we get into the ocean, it changes a lot. Rather than very specific um, definitions or specific uh, designations of a particular location, we have much more general legal constructs. And um, because you and I don't live in the ocean, um, we have mostly, well, well okay, so, so the big thing that's missing here, anybody wanna guess what the big thing here between the land and the sea is in terms of this sort of land use and sort of land definition thing? It, 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 you know, so just it's logistically a harder place to look at, right? So we just can't just look out and see every mountaintop, or a lot of it's underwater, so good, excellent. What else? Yes, so the key thing is on land we have private ownership, right? That's in our country, but that's in many countries as well, right? At sea, generally speaking, we do not have private ownership, right? So the bottom of the ocean isn't owned. You can't put your house there and pay somebody some money and then you just, you can do whatever you want and shoot the drones down that fly over you or anything like that, right? So it's much more nature-driven constructs that, that help us understand what's going on as opposed to court, as opposed to individual tort law or something like that. And I'm just showing you this picture of, of looking out at LA with the waves. And, and so I like this picture because it, it, the, the lights are kind of crisp and the ocean is kind of fuzzy. And that's sort of how this, um, I think how you should think about this land versus the sea. Okay, so we can, we can talk about these management relevant geographies in a couple different ways. So I'm gonna break them down for you by, um, the most common ones are, are by depth. How far into the ocean are we? Um, what particular legal agreement we might have made with other countries or what we call a treaty. Um, and then we'll also talk about location and then we'll spend a little bit of time just, just mentioning basins. And then we'll talk about some other just additional ones. Okay, so there's so not a whole lot of things you have to memorize in this class per se, but this is one, these terms are one of them. So you should know what these terms mean. Um, now, the first thing to say with this, I like this figure. I've, I've looked for other ones over the years and it's a little bit kind of clip arty, but, but I think it really makes it very clear as far as um, the different parts of the ocean. So, so I just want to first say that the depths here are exaggerated and, and, and the X and Y, is that this is, this is a, an illustration, right, of, of stuff. And it's not always exactly, this is not to scale in other words. Um, okay, so uh, we have a couple different parts here. Continental shelf is that part up there, that's what you and I mostly interact with. That's what you and I are mostly uh, dealing with in terms of our most common management challenges, um, impacts, things of that nature. 
Uh, then we have the continental slope. As I, I'm starting from the left of the figure, going to the right. Then we hit the continental slope, which is this sort of drop off. Um, we have the this, um, which is more or less a fairly consistent slope as as we go down the continental slope. Then before we get to the bottom, there's sort of a, a change in the angle, and that's basically stuff that's fallen down. The continental slope. That, so think of a bunch of rocks at the bottom of a hill or on that turn on the road where all the rocks accumulate near the bend kind of thing. Um, and, then, and then we hit the abyssal plain. And most of the ocean, the, the bottom of most of the ocean, the benthos, is mostly abyssal plain. So that's more or less flat, rolling, rolling hills kind of thing, right? Uh, not, not much elevational change. These areas, and so then the plain is punctuated by a few things as we move around the world's ocean. Um, we have some of these things that are big rents in the big, big fissures in the uh, ocean, and we call those trenches. Uh, we also have sort of the reverse, which are submarine ridges, which is, which is a, a, a mountain range basically in the middle of the of the basin. And then uh, we also have uh, volcanic islands. So we also have some areas where the classic example would be Hawaii, the hot spot, the, the, for reasons we don't fully understand, the, the thinning of the mantle uh, over, over that particular part of the planet so that it's easy for lava to come up. And so lava comes up, deposits, and essentially grows its own mountain. And so we have volcanic islands that can also punctuate the abyssal plain. So here are those things again. Oh, I forgot to mention continents. Obviously, there's continents. That's where, that's where you and I are living. So that's the terrestrial part. Yeah. I was just wondering, what do you define as the uh, basin exactly? Uh, we'll get to that. Great question. So, so what do we mean by the basin? The basin is the chunk of water between continents, basically. So we'll, we'll, we'll hold that question in a few minutes. I'll show you some basins. But good question. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just wasn't really shown in the figure. The, the, the rise, is it like a decrease or a, like a, the slope is out. Yes. But yeah. it's not plain yet. It's not plain. Correct. Literally, it's the buildup of, of sediments and stuff that have fallen down. And so um, uh, you can imagine somehow if we went and we, and we had a big giant, you know, theoretical excavator, we had a big giant, you know, bucket and went to, you know, right here and scraped all this stuff up, it would go pretty sharply to the abyssal plain, basically. And so it's, it's just millions of years of buildup of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so again, we have continents, we have the shelf, and, and much of the shelf was, at least at one point in our planet's history, exposed to the air. Um, so sea levels have risen, sea levels have fallen, and so the shelf is essentially the same stuff as the continents. It's just, this happens to be underwater, but the same sort of underlying uh, bedrock or, or rock formations, etc. The continental slope is relatively steep here. So it varies between about 1 and 15 degrees with the average, um, the average slope about 4 degrees. This gets really hard. I, this is in all textbooks, 4 degrees. I guess it's 4 degrees. How to actually measure all the different slopes of the world and average them, I, I, I don't know. But, but, it, but it gives you the sense, right? So most of it is just a constant slope. So you can imagine if you had a beach ball or something and kind of tossed it, it would just sort of keep rolling, 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 rolling. Zoom tight. As I mentioned, the continental rise is, is more of this sort of lumpiness of accumulation of stuff. The abyssal plain is a flat thing. I should say that, that we talk about the Atlantic mid-ocean ridge, et cetera, but this, it's, a, it's really a contiguous ribbon between these different plates, tectonic plates that go around uh, the world. Okay. And the ridges and the trenches are both, in, are both the, the result of um, tectonic plate activity moving. Some are spreading apart, some are coming together, um, some are rubbing past each other, etc. So we can look at an example off our east coast to sort of maybe illustrate this. Um, and so the purple part here would be the, the, the terrestrial, the dry land. And then as we're going off of Cape Cod or whatever, we have this relatively flat area, right? 
So it's basically no different than the land, uh, than the rock formations on the land to the left in the purple. It's just that the sea happens to be on top. Of, the, the salt water tends to be above it. And then at some point we go and we hit this relatively dramatic break, right? Where, where stuff drops off. And then we get the bulk of the ocean is this lower elevational, uh, uh, more or less flat plain. Okay, so that's sort, of, that, 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 that's sort of the physical geography. Then we can talk about stuff by legal treaty, by agreement. And there's various terms that have used. Some of these are older terms. Some of them are, are newer terms. But we should, I just want to at least mention these. And there, there are potentially many others, but, but these are the ones I think that are most common that you'll encounter. So the first is territorial seas. That refers to an area next to a country or, or, or an area that a country controls, right? It's within their territory. Once, or in the wake of World War II, when um, the U.S. was ascendant and we had all of this new technology that allowed us to more easily get to farther away places in the ocean more reliably, more quickly, um, and the technology like sonar and really high efficiency winches and things that we could um, uh, more aggressively exploit some of these resources, biological resources, abio abiotic resources, et cetera. Um, uh, we um, started working on a thing called the Convention on the Law of the Sea or, or, or CLOS or CLOS. Um, and one of the terms that comes out of that is this notion of exclusive economic zone. So this was a U.S. created idea, and then we pushed it on the rest of the world, and now it's, it's, it's used. Although newer terms are coming in, but, but you sometimes see this referred to as the EEZ, or if someone's from a British-speaking country, they'll say the EEZ. Um, and this is, uh, again, this is, this is like the territorial seas, but it's... it's uh, it's a legal definition, and currently this is um, for, for most of the countries that touch the ocean, it's a 200 nautical mile uh, uh, fringe. We create, the U.S. picked that number because, because of stuff like this. So we wanted, one, to, to make sure we controlled all of our continental shelf, and also we wanted access to deep sea resources. So we wanted access to things like deep sea mining, deep sea oil extraction, that kind of stuff, in, potentially in the abyssal plain. And so we picked that 200 nautical mile limit so that we could make sure that it was, that it, we, we captured all those potential resources. And we didn't let other people that might be motoring in take a, quote unquote our tuna or our oil or, or whatever, right? Um, okay. Okay, and so the, the EEZ would be contrasted with something like the high seas or the areas that are, that are you know, no one controls and they're out in the middle of, of um, you know, nowhere kind of thing. Um, more, on, more on the Convention on the Law of the Sea later. Uh, you also sometimes hear outer continental shelf. And so that is, or OCS, um, that is, for example, where we have some of our windmills or some of our offshore wind power that we're, we're locating off of San Luis Obispo and Humboldt and things like that. And so, again, outer continental shelf is sometimes just called the OCS. Um, extended continental shelf, same idea. Um, this would be areas that, that are even farther out. A new term that I'm seeing more and more uh, used that nobody seems to ever <laughs> define, they just assume everybody knows it, um, is also essentially stemming from the Convention on the Law of the Sea. I should say the U.S. was the lead designer and architect of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. We're one of the only nations to not sign, to not be a signatory of that treaty. As is mostly the case in the last 20 or 30 years, the U.S., uh, to, to get a um, treaty ratified, it has to be ratified through the Senate and We've not ratified the Biodiversity Treaty. We've not ratified the Convention on the Law of the Sea. There's all these things we've not ratified because, you know, we're not going to have people tell us what to do. Um, and that's caused uh, issues, um, to say the least. Uh, in any event, um, but uh, one of these areas is the, or one of these terms is beyond national jurisdiction or BNJ. 
And so you'll see this in terms of marine areas, uh, uh, or sometimes called ABNJ, or people talking about biodiversity, they'll talk about BBNJ. So, so those terms are all meaning for things really far away, right? So you can think of those as basically equivalent to the high seas and that kind of stuff. Cool? Okay. Okay, um, you'll see a lot of, or, or, or oftentimes with this oceanic stuff, you'll hear references to nautical mile. We never use nautical mile. The only people that use nautical mile are, are people um, that are dealing with marine shipping issues kind of stuff, and it's a legacy term. So originally, it was defined as one minute of latitude, so it's kind of close to a mile, and so that's why we use the term nautical mile. Um, but it's actually about 1 point, almost 1.2 miles. So it's, it's longer than a, a statutory mile. Um, the other problem is that there's no single international one symbol. It's not like KM where everybody abbreviates kilometers that way, right? It's, it's you'll, you see, depending on what um, what map or what uh, legal document you're looking at, sometimes it's M and you're like, wait, isn't that meters? Yes, but they'll use a capital. It's like, oh, it's different, right? So it's super confusing. So you sometimes see M, sometimes see NM, sometimes see NMI, um, you sometimes see just NM. Uh, you know, uh, we won't use this term very much, but if you ever do happen to have use for it, I would say just spell out nautical mile and there's no confusion. Um, it, it's never a problem to, to say something fully. We, we like to abbreviate stuff to go faster. In this case, because it is not a commonly used term and there's not a commonly uh, uh, agreed upon single symbol, it's best just to say nautical miles so we're sure there's no confusion. We're not talking about nanometers here or something like that. Okay, so um, again, uh, this is what our this is what we're uh, the, the main thing that we're looking at in terms of our geographies. Again, the continental shelf, shelf slope rise, and the plain. Um, oh, okay, yeah, and so so I think what I wanted to say with this diagram is just that the, the, these definitions are variable. It's going to depend on what coastline we're moving from. There's no. It's not the case that that. Um, 200 nautical miles is always going to be on the continental slope or never on the continental slope. It's a highly variable local geography um, as far as distance from uh, land for any one of these uh, particular things, uh, dimensions. Um, so you'll see some of these types of things in legal, in legal uh, geographies um, where uh, this might be for a particular country, and this might be for a particular um, state. Uh, you might have a pretty clear um, uh, exclusive economic zone that might fall all on a continental shelf or whatever, but again, realize it is, um, it is variable. Okay, let's look at our exclusive economic zone. And so here are all U.S. territories. And so we are the, the grade, the, the Obviously, the terrestrial part is a terrestrial part, but then the, the gray buffering are areas that are in our uh, exclusive economic zone. And so most of these things off here in the Pacific were a consequence of World War II, right? So after World War II, um, we took territory and we basically kept them. Um, some of the stuff predates World War II, but most of the stuff was, was uh, in the wake of the U.S. trying to move across the Pacific to fight uh, the Japanese um, who, had, who had occupied many of these uh, uh, islands. Um, and so because we have, you know, we don't have the, the, the craziest coastline, right, necessarily, um, but because we have Alaska and because we have um, these islands as part of our country, we have this massive amount of sea that we, um, that we claim as, as ours and only we can do stuff in it. Okay. Um, next, let's talk about how we can define. Is there questions? Any questions about that? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, what about when countries might overlap? Great question. So the question is, okay, so what happens if, like, the class would be like the Mediterranean? We're in the Mediterranean, right? And and we're in a basin, and we have our coastline. But if I go 200 odd miles south, let's say, 
I'm going to maybe be on land of somebody else. So in those cases where, okay, so if we take Hawaiian Islands, we just draw, we just, you know, Krieg it. We just, we just do a buffer and say, ah, oh, it's ours. But you can imagine there was, what if there was another country right off of Hilo or something, right? In that case, um, it's usually the, the difference is split. So if we were 100 miles from somewhere else, we would say the EEZ only goes 50 miles for our waters and then the others. Uh, in some cases, it um, has to be negotiated individually. So um, a classic case is um, in Norway. So, uh, so we'll, maybe we'll talk about that when we get to oil and gas. But um, so, uh, and this, this was this played out just a couple decades ago. Another classic case is, I'm glad I'm not classic, but um, a thing that may well lead to war if we're not careful, is in the South China Sea, China is using this to claim um, uh, their, their, so, so China wants to own and control all of the South China Sea. They do not, right? They do not by legal agreement. They never have um, that kind of stuff. Um, but what they've been doing is they've been going in, as I showed a slide a couple weeks ago, um, and, and essentially uh, claiming this, this, is a, this is our island and then occupying it and then fill, you know, destroying the coral reefs, fill it in with sand, putting in a, a permanent establishment, a base, that they'll use euphemisms to describe it basically, or, or bases, and then say, ah, 200 nautical miles from here, here's our buffer, this is us, right? And so, um, so there's, there's various uh, tensions that this has caused and is currently causing in those areas where it's not just a 200 miles out to sea kind of thing. So it's a real, it's a very real um, problem that people in the White House and elsewhere have to deal with uh, constantly. The Philippines and China are almost battling daily in terms of um, some of these offshore islands. Um, another, another hot spot historically has been some of the northern island, islands in Japan, off of Japan and Russia are other, another classic place where these folks have been fighting. Okay, good, other questions? Yeah, so Canada, like, for, so, so Canada's EEZ would be like this, whoop, you know, between Alaska and the U.S., and then all the Nova Scotia and all this kind of area up here, um, and then there's a there's a division between Greenland and and um, and Canada there. But yeah, good. Other questions? Okay, cool. Okay, next let's talk about um, just location. And these, these terms are really, really key. Another set of terms you guys really need to just know these by heart. These are, these are important to memorize. And so I'm showing these things as contrasts. That's usually how they're, they're described. So when we talk, when you read it in a paper or see it in a paper, it's you know this versus that. And so the first would be um, close versus far from land or from the shoreline. And so close would be neuritic, and far would be oceanic. Um, similarly, relative, relative to the bottom of the ocean, we could talk about being in the water column of the ocean, or at or touching the bottom, so near or, or, or on the bottom. And so the water column would be pelagic, and the bottom would either be benthic if we're talking about stuff that, you know, sediment that, that's sitting on the, the bottom, or if it's a critter, we could talk about a demersal, like a demersal fish. So pelagic versus demersal or pelagic versus benthic. Other key things here, which we'll get to in a minute, but another key contrast is, is for uh, organisms things that can move themselves around the water wherever they want to go versus critters that are mostly floating, that are mostly passive occupants and are letting the moving waters take them wherever they go. Um, and, uh, and another term is, is, yeah, I think I have, this is probably hard for you guys to see. Okay, never mind. thought I had a different slide here. Uh, okay, we can also talk about... Um, uh, near something versus far away. So near would be proximate or proximal. And then 
uh, far away would be um, distal. And then lastly, uh, we have some terms for things that are in the illuminated part of the ocean, which is a very small part of the ocean, or the dark part of the ocean, and here I'm referring to sunlight dark, uh, which is the vast majority of the ocean volume is, is uh, sunlight does not penetrate. Okay, so let's so so those are the things, and then let's look at uh, the the terms that we can uh, uh, how they apply. So again, the cartoon. This is exaggerated for for um, purposes of what we're talking about here. But on the left we have the the land, and on the right we have the the ocean basin, and we're going down into the um, down into the the ocean. Okay, so we I guess we'll start here. So we have the the stuff near the land, right near the edges, which is neuritic. Um, we have stuff that's far out in the ocean, and, which is in the pelagic realm. And then you'll sometimes hear these terms. Um, and so uh, intertidal is the land that is at least some, at some point in the year dry, and at least at some point in the year wet with seawater. Areas that are along the coast, but that are above the intertidal are supratidal or supralitoral. And so that might get some ocean water in a big hurricane or something like that, but you know, big winds or something, but normally this does not get, um, does not have seawater on it. Okay, so we hit intertidal. So that's the area between the, the air and the water, constantly mixing, up, down, up, down, up, down. The subtitle is the area that is always underwater and is never once in the air. And, and, and the depth here, I have some depth on the right. Again, this is gonna be, there's gonna be some variance here based on local geographies and water. This is just to sort of give you some, some illustration. Okay, so subtitle. And subtitle can be used to apply to all these different areas. So subtitle is sometimes used to apply to things, you know, the bottom of the ocean and stuff too. But usually it's relative to the coastal zone. So usually subtitle is something in contrast to intertidal when you hear people talking about it. Um, once we start to go uh, uh, down into the water, uh, so far as we're going from the top of the ocean down, we're still all in light. So I can see you, you can see me. We go down a few more meters and I can still see you, you can still see me. We go down, I can still see you. And after a while, I start to be able to see you, but you're getting a little hard to see. And I go down a little farther and I can kind of still sort of, sort of see you. And then go down. And eventually at some point we're going to go down. Even at high noon in the middle of summer, um, I, can't, I can't see you, right? Um, and so that is the so-called photic or the light penetrating zone. So the photic zone is where photons from the sun uh, get, get down into the ocean. So this is where we're having our oceanic primary productivity. This is where our phytoplankton are, this is where our kelps are, all that kind of stuff. This is where most of the carbon is fixed in the ocean. Okay, once we drop below that light penetrating zone, we get into the aphotic or the non-light zone. Now, just because I say aphotic doesn't mean it's pitch black all the time. There's lots of bioluminescence, life-generated light, but it's not the kind of light that we would um, used for photosynthesis. Okay, as we hit that area, we call that the, um, uh, uh, the, the bathyl area. Then as we go even deeper, we get into the abyssal area, which is like the really deep, and then the deepest of the deep are hadal. And hadal derives from the term Hades, like you're down in hell, right? So, so we'll talk more about pressure and things like that. But these abyssal and hadal systems are also sometimes called deep sea, deep sea systems. Okay, so that's the, the, the chunks of the ocean. For critters that live there, these are the terms we apply to the, to the life that lives there. So things that live at or, or on the surface of the ocean uh, are nuston. And so that I would say, you know, that's usually the top meter, you know, one, two, three meters, something like that. So it's a really, really shallow things. So think of by the wind sailors or things that are floating on the water. Um, little larval fish that are associated with floating sargassum uh, uh, patches, things like that. Okay, then once we get into the main water column, we have two general terms that, that you'll see in our readings and, and, and you'll encounter. 
plankton and nekton. So plankton are things that are, for the most part, not, not moving themselves. So their, their movements are primarily dictated by the currents. So if the currents are going south and this little, this little organism was born here, he's going to end up south, right? He's going to flow south. In contrast, nekton might well also move with the currents, but they, if they decide they want to go north or west or east, they can just move. And so usually, not always, but usually that means they're a much larger critter, like a fish or a whale or something like that. And then for those critters that live at or, at or attached to the bottom, those are called a benthos or benthic um, uh, uh, animals, organisms. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. Uh, so then we have the question about basins. So what do we mean by basins? So this is what we mean by basins. So basins are the areas between the continents that are, that are in the water. So here, here are um, the most conspicuous basins. We have the Pacific Ocean. We have, the, which, is, which is the largest, which is the biggest um, basin area. We usually, we usually subdivide it, but still, because it's so big. But basically, we have the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Basin. This is, you know, side to side, north to south, the biggest area. And it's also the deepest on average. Uh, the next biggest is the Atlantic o Ocean, or the Atlantic Basin. Uh, the Arctic is very shallow um, and is very small. Um, the Indian Ocean is uh, primarily only in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and then the Antarctic Ocean, is a, is a, a, which might just look like a continuation of the Pacific or the Atlantic, because of atmospheric circulation, um, it really is, for, in many instances, cut off from the rest of the planet, atmospherically. Uh, and also the shallow water is, in effect, oftentimes separated from the rest of the ocean basin. Uh, rest of the ad uh, adjacent oceans, even though it looks like they're contiguous. Yeah? Um, would the reason they drill a lot in the Arctic Ocean is because it's shallow? Easier, easier to drill? Yeah, so the question is, you know, what, uh, you know what's, what's up with all the interest in the Arctic? Obviously, it's because we have climate change. So first and foremost, uh, there's not as much ice that was there, which is the big barrier in the past. Um, uh, and so one, we can get into the Arctic more and more these days. So we're having shipping, cruise ships, stuff like that, go, you know, you know travel um, in an area where 100 years ago, there's no way they could even think about doing that. They'd be destroyed or, or seriously damaged. Um, but yes, one of the reasons why there's such interest in that is, is one, because now it's, it's, it's much faster to say ship stuff from Northern Europe to Canada, let's say, right? Really can be really fast or, or from, from Europe to Asia, that kind of thing the so-called Northwest Passage that was dreamed of for years and years and years by, by um, explorers for a long time. Um, but it's also really desirous because of that exact question, because of that exact comment, because it is shallow. So it's relatively easy to fish the fish that are there. If you want to put in oil extraction, as Russia is trying to do, it's relatively easy. I, I, I should be careful. It's not relatively easy. Um, um, it is quite dangerous because of the forming ice, and it's highly likely that we'll have major oil spills and things of that nature. But, but depth-wise, it's easier than some of the other deeper basins. So it's attractive. It's attractive because it's 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 increasingly ice-free and it's relatively shallow. Yes, good questions. Other, yeah. Is the split between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean in Southeast Asia is that a result of a geographic feature? You're talking, you're talking about this chunk right here. Uh, this is, this is, it's, it, it, it's more about water, water circulation. So there's so many islands here and they're, and they're relatively shallow that they effectively create a bowl. So most of these oceans are, you can think of them almost like a little, like a soup bowl. It's sort of sitting there. It's not exactly correct, but, but in effect, a lot of times they act that way. And so, and so, yeah, so these, these, I, this, this terrestrial sort of bridge thing acts as something. Yes, you can get on a sailboat and sail through there, but for the most part, most of the water is, is moving, say, north or south there. Other questions? Yeah. The, so the Arctic and the Antarctic, it's not owned by anyone. It's kind of like treaty-based or? 
Uh, okay, so the question is ownership. So we'll get to that when we talk, we'll get to the Antarctic when we talk about the Arctic. We have the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty specifically says that this area of the planet should not be owned by anyone, that it is, that it's, you know, everybody's shared uh, heritage. However, if you have a military base or a research base, that's considered your territory. So, so the stations I used to work at in Antarctica were U.S. territorial, you know, things. Like if I, if I shot someone, I would be held under U.S., you know, charged under U.S. law kind of thing. Uh, I, would, I worked out of a station on the Antarctic Peninsula called Palmer Station, which does mostly biology. But um, some of the, the largest station, which is on the other side of the continent, McMurdo, they have their own jail, right? And so, so like U.S. laws apply there, for example. Um, there is some controversy <clears throat> with places like Argentina has sort of claimed that actually they own a pie wedge of Antarctica, but, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's international. Um, the Arctic, though, it's not, it's not clear because we, we never, we didn't really think too much about it when we were creating these laws because the, it was all frozen ice and like, so you, so so, Antarctica has solid land, even though it's it's mostly covered with huge glaciers, but it's still it's a it's a landmass. There's no landmass in the Arctic, so there's no land that you would claim per se. However, there is this you know exclusive economic zone, which again because we couldn't navigate it historically, nobody really paid attention to. Now as things are opening up, that exact question is becoming a huge thing. And Russia, because Russia has this huge, you know, Russia is basically all of essentially Northern Europe and Asia, that, that whole chunk, right? They're like, ah, it's us. We're doing what we want, you know, kind of thing. I think, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I think they have, they just commissioned, was it 32 new icebreakers? I think they have 60 icebreakers, uh, like the, the federal, um, under federal control. Um, we have two. U.S. is two, um, and it's like pulling teeth to try to get the Congress to authorize construction of money for another another one or two for us, right? So clearly, these these Arctic powers really see that moving through ice and clearing ice early is becoming even more and more important. So yeah. If you wanted to put like a research station there, uh, uh, sorry, there we mean in the Arctic. Yeah. Uh huh. Antarctic? Oh, Antarctic. Uh huh. So, <laughs> yeah, so the question is, so maybe we should save these, these are great questions, maybe we should save them for our Antarctica lecture. Suffice it to say, this was all Cold War. Well, not all Cold War, but, but modern stuff was all Cold War. So all of our bases, the bases I worked out of, originally a Navy base. It's all a military thing. It's all how big, is our, how big, how big can we puff our chest out, we're real men, all that kind of stuff. Um, um, we have three permanent bases in Antarctica, meaning humans are there year-round, 24-7. That's Palmer, which is on this, this peninsula right here, um, mostly doing marine biology. There's McMurdo, which on this map you can't really see. It's over here in the far left. Um, McMurdo is the largest base. <clears throat> in the, at the actual South Pole is the Abinson Scott Station, which is, it, it, so the ice is moving. So the station moves a bit every year, but it's very, very close to the actual, you know, literal South Pole, but it moves a little bit. Um, by, I mean, just to give you a sense, um, like summertime, austral summer, so our winter is the peak occupancy there. And, you know, uh, I have to remember now, but uh, Palmer is probably like peak occupancy, like 60 people, something like that, 60 humans, something like that. Um, Amundsen Scott South Pole Station is probably like, I don't know, 200 people, something like that. McMurdo is like 1,200 people. Um, and then we have uh, uh, seasonal camps, about 20, I don't know the exact number, but something on the order of many dozens, 20-ish, something like that, of camps that we only go to for like, say, three months of the year when it's, when it's, sun, when it's sunny down there. Um, and so the main bases there are the U.S. and Russia. Um, so Russia holds the record for the deepest drilling into Arctic ice, and they have the record for the coldest temperature recorded on Earth at, Vos at their Vostok base, 
where it was like the air temperature, I don't remember, is something like, I don't remember, something crazy, like one, minus 190 degrees or something like that. I mean, it's crazy ass cold. So, um, so the US and Russia were there. Uh, the, the British are, have many, many bases too. Australia, New Zealand, because they're, they're very close. Um, France has a fair number of bases. In recent years, India has established more bases. Um, and, and essentially it was considered, uh, you know, political power kind of thing. Like, we're, like, we have this, like, we're, we're, you know, we're su a superpower, we can do stuff. Other countries have bases as well, but, but they're a much smaller fraction. All of our bases were originally established by the military. So when I used to go there, everything was super cheap because it was all PX prices. It was all like you're in the Navy or something. And so beer was super cheap and like, you know, all this stuff was super cheap. And then the cruise ships would come in every once in a while, which was a new thing back then in the 90s. Um, and all the prices would get jacked up like five, six, seven times for the tourists. And the tourists would leave and the prices would go back to normal. And so, so the, the um, security of these bases is still provided by the U.S. military. So flying into, so to get to the, to the South Pole, you have to fly in. And so that's supported by, you know, sort of, you know, Department of Defense aircraft. Um, it used to be back in the day, all the logistics were done by the military. They would bring in supplies. Um, but starting in about the 70s and 80s, the National Science Foundation started taking those over. And now essentially, the, with the exception of like icebreakers to come in and open up McMurdo, it's all uh, civilian controlled, even though it was established by the military. Other countries have followed that. So Argentina, their bases are established by the military and there's some scientists there and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, more on that when we talk about Antarctica, but, but that's, that's Antarctica. There are no bases, there, I mean, there's, there's no permanent occupancy in the Arctic because there's no land to establish. Okay, get near the end here. Okay, so then, so then uh, so we talk, we're talking about basins there. Um, that was a good, that was a good uh, digression from basins, but we're talking about basins. So we have the, these main basins and then, um, for these, uh, for especially the Pacific, which is what I want to highlight here, um, uh, we for, for all these basins, there are sub-basins or, or sort of more operational units because these are such large areas to deal with. So the one I'll just um, particularly point out to you is that we usually talk about the North Pacific because it, the whole basin is so gigantor. We talk about the North Pacific and the South Pacific, and we talk about the Eastern um, Pacific Basin and the Western Pacific Basin. And so remember when we talk about, and this is one thing that I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with because it gets confusing. So we're on the west coast, right? We're in California, we're on the west coast. But if we talk about the Pacific, we're in the eastern Pacific, right? We're on the, we're on the western edge of the land and the eastern edge of the sea. So um, sometimes that, that, that confuses people. And then we have the same kind of, you know, most of the other basins are so much smaller, we only usually break them down into the northern and the, and the, and the southern uh, sections. Okay. Um, uh, basins, I've described them sort of like a bowl or, or a bathtub. They're not exactly that. They're, there's, there's topography and stuff. Um, so I'll just say that, yeah, they're, it's more, comple more complex than just a simple bowl. Um, and this is the, um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example. Um, you guys know this, we don't need to spend much time, but just suffice it to say, uh, we use latitude and longitude. Right, there's where we are. Um, we have, uh, uh, west of the prime meridian is, a, is negative by convention. Uh, east of the prime meridian that goes through Greenwich, England is positive, and then, um, which is arbitrary. Um, but Latin lawn, or me, but, but latitude, excuse me, is dictated by the middle of our spinning earth, right? So, the, so the latitude is pretty, pretty straightforward. It's the longitude that, that somebody had to do something. And because Britain was the big sea power at the time and Navy, they just said, here, here it is. And we're just going to start using this. And so that's why we have the, um, the longitude, the way we, we do it. Um, for our purposes, and I think for most of your purposes going forward, um, you should probably use decimal degrees when you are talking about latitude and stuff. Just, it's just the easiest thing to write when you throw something in Google Maps or whatever. You can use degrees, minutes, seconds, or whatever, but, but decimal degrees is pretty much the simplest thing. And so, for example, our campus is about 34 degrees by minus 119. 
Okay. All right. We'll wrap up with just some, uh, some, so those are the main things, but then I also just wanted to highlight before we take a break here, um, the key, some examples of key management geographies. And if there's other ones you want to ask about, ask me. These are just examples of things that have, have played, um, you know, important roles over, over the years. And so, um, so I'll just run through these real quick as examples of uh, important areas you should know about. Uh, one is the Great Barrier Reef. So this is um, off of Australia, off the north and north uh, eastern coast of, that was weird, uh, of Australia. And so this is the largest biogenic structure on Earth, right? So this is a living reef. This is a mass of, of, of living coral, reef-building coral. It's on the order of about a thousand islands and all kinds of other smaller islands. It, we find in the Great Barrier Reef about 25% of all the macroscopic marine species uh, in the world's oceans. Um, there's something like more than 3,000 individual conspicuously identifiable reefs, something like uh, 1,600 fish species, which is about 10% of all the species, marine species identified uh, on Earth, something like 600 plus coral species. My son's doing a project where he's been looking at uh, coral bleaching and the diversity of coral is a challenge for him because there's so many species. Um, it, it, the whole thing is a World Heritage Site. It generates something on the order of about $6.4 billion dollars to the Australian economy, primarily through tourism, but also through storm protection and, and things of that nature. Um, and it's suffering continued bleaching. I strongly encourage you guys to go check out the Great Barrier Reef. Um, at current rates, it is unlikely to exist the way it is now uh, for much longer. Hopefully we don't lose the thing as a whole, but, but um, you can see this, this the, the, the clearest evidence of life you can see from space, other than just terrestrial plants. Um, this is what it looks like. So we have the, the land on the bottom here and then this whole network of shallow um, reefs and caves and things of that nature. Okay, next, the Coral Triangle. This is the area in, in that chunk that uh, Carson or somebody was asking me about. Um, uh, so now we're going north of Australia. And this is this area that's defined by the Philippines, Solomon, uh, over to through Indonesia. And it makes a rough triangle. Um, so this place was really important, for example, for, for Alfred Wallace and his theory of evolution. He almost beat Darwin to the punch. And when he wrote Darwin, uh, uh, hey, hey, bud, what do you think about this? Darwin freaked out. And then that's when he started writing his origin of the species because he'd been thinking about it for a long time, but that's what spurred him to write it. And so there's tremendous diversity here, which attracted Wallace um, and other people. Um, and so uh, this is uh, really, really important. So it's a relatively small chunk of the surface area of the, the world's ocean or, or, or land, but it has a tremendous amount of diversity. And so this is where almost all the marine diversity peaks. Fish diversity, coral diversity, invertebrate diversity. So this coral triangle is the mothership for tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of diversity on life. So I have it here as 1.5% of the ocean surface area, but 30% of all the coral reefs and 76% of all the coral species. Another example would be the, um, the deepest part of the ocean, which is the Challenger Deep, which is a specific part of the Marianas Trench. And this is a, uh, there's a chunk of islands here, uh, the Mariana Archipelago, and the, the, um, the, the trench is uh, alongside those uh, islands. And it's deep, it's 11 kilometers deep. It's deep, 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 deep. deep. We, we haven't talked about this yet, but the average um, uh, depth of the ocean is about four kilometers, right? So the average depth of the abyssal plain is about four kilometers. This is way deeper, right? This is, this is a, a, a big giant hole cut in the bottom of the ocean. Um, we've only, humans have only been there twice. Once was, I'm sorry, let me see what's going on here. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, so, 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 so tremendous challenges with managing these resources. It's very, very difficult. Um, so uh, these guys went down in <laughs> this crazy story. I think I have a reading. For, did I already give it to you guys, the bath escape? Did I give you guys that reading yet? 
Yeah, maybe not. But um, but crazy story. These guys basically built a metal sphere and just dropped down to the bottom um, about sixty, about seventy years ago, um, and like literally just went down to the bottom. And as they're going down, they started hearing these bang, bang, bang. Like, should we keep going down? Yeah, sure. Let's keep going down. And so they kept going down, and they got to the bottom. Um, these two humans in essentially a, a, a steel sphere. Uh, and saw that there were fish at the bottom of the earth, living fish, moving fish. And they're like, what? We didn't think things could live this at this pressure and this temperature and everything. Um, it would take until uh, uh, the last decade or so for humans to get back there. And it would take James Cameron, who is a super enthusiastic deep ocean guy. It's one of the reasons why he made Titanic, because he wanted to have an excuse to go look at the Titanic. So I guess we've got to make a movie to justify the budgets, whatever. So he built his own one-person sub to get to the bottom. Um, many, many times we've tried to go back and the, even ROVs, the robots, break down before they get to the bottom. So it's a challenging place to work. Uh, I would say that we've, but we have impacts there too. Now when we go down and take pictures, we can see plastic waste and things of that nature there. Um, another important uh, area is the Drake's Passage. This is the area between the tip of uh, South America and that, that comma, that sort of up, up ticking comma from Antarctica, um, which, is <clears throat> which, which basically in effect creates a relatively narrow chunk of water. And, and this is the only place, the Drake's Passage is the only place, if we picked a globe and I put my thumb or my, my finger on the globe and spun it, it's the only place that I won't hit land on the earth if we stay at one latitude. So everywhere else, eventually we hit, we hit, a, hit a coastline, hit an island, hit something. Here, you don't. And because of that, it allows when the winds start to go, there's nothing to break it up. There's, there's no land, no, no different thermal mass, no nothing. And so, so um, it creates this huge um, uh, uh, <clears throat> differentiation between the area, shallow ocean and the atmosphere above it and below it. Um, and these are very, very dangerous seas. These are really um, treacherous seas to pass. But for shipping, international shipping, it's one of the ways people um, uh, you know, have moved um, goods and services around the planet. Okay, we also have our mid-oceanic ridge. Um, and so uh, the vast, vast majority of it is underwater. There's a few places where it comes up shallow, like a little island. But for the most part, it's down deep. You can't really see it. Um, and uh, it, <clears throat> it it's essentially looks like a Frankenstein stitch across um, the bottom of the ocean if we were to drain all the water out. And it's mostly, it's mostly shallower than the, again, it's not the abyssal plain, which as I mentioned, it's about four kilometers on average. <clears throat> the average depth of the top of the ridge is about two and a half kilometers, so it's shallower. <clears throat> we can also talk about some of the management challenges that are created by these geographies. And so the one that's become um, most conspicuous to the general public are the so-called garbage patches. And these are accumulations, and these are because of basin circulation, because of general occurrence and movement of <clears throat> air and water masses near the surface, they act to essentially concentrate stuff. Historically, we've talked about that in terms of life, in terms of larvae and, and baby fish moving around and things of that nature. Now we most conspicu conspicuously see it in the context of, of plastic. Um, and so I just, so I'll just say that. It's an important thing to talk about. It's real, we gotta deal with it. But it's not as if it's a, a floating island of plastic that you can walk across. It's, it's, a, it's a concentration, it's an elevated concentration of waste. But it's not, um, it's not, it's not necessarily like a, 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 you know, a solid landfill kind of thing of stuff. But anyway, um, and, and the most famous of these is the, is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is the one in the northern, here it says the North Pacific Gyre. So it sometimes looks like this, but it's usually not as quite as dramatic as this. But you can see this just accumulation of stuff in the middle of the ocean. Another key geography are our important shipping channels. So... I know the ocean looks like vast and is just open and you do whatever. There really are, in effect, highways on the ocean. And that's because, yes, I could go from, I don't know, Singapore to wherever, however I want to go. But if you're making money on this, you don't want to burn 
fuel and waste time, right? So people, are, people pick the most efficient pathway from point X to point Y. And that therefore creates these so-called shipping channels. Back in the day, when this was, when international shipping was primarily dictated by sail power, this was not the case. Because you sometimes had to go up a couple miles or 10 or 50 miles to find a, a wind blowing east or west to take you across the basin. So there wasn't this, everybody wasn't necessarily always concentrated in an area. But now that we have self-powered vessels for the last century or so, century and a half, um, now people just go where they want to go for the most part. And so that's created these things. So what we're looking at, these are ship tracks of, of many thousands and thousands and thousands of vessels. And what you see is, yeah, there's, a, there's some light everywhere, right? So there's always somebody that for whatever reason, a storm or whatever has gone south or whatever. But for the most part, we see these really hot zones that people are going to. And one of the things that's attracting these, these uh, 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 points, if you will, are these important passages or, the, or shipping channels. So let's start with talking about this one in the middle right here, the Strait of Hormuz, which is in the news almost daily now. We have a big giant oil spill going on there now because some of the rebel groups in Yemen decided to basically blow up an oil ship and it's like leaking and when people try to go <clears throat> clean it up, other people shoot at them and so it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so the Strait of Hormuz is going to connect the Gulf of Oman to the Persian Gulf and it is... Uh, before our current turmoil in the Middle East, it's where the, a huge amount of the world's oil goes through that comes from the Middle East. And so it's in effect a pinch point. Um, we have other important shipping channels. The English Channel, which is between the UK and France, uh, southern, U southern UK and, and Normandy. Um, it to give you a sense, it has on the order of about 500 ships a day go through that. And by ships, these are big ships. These are massive vessels. This isn't like a sailboat. This is, this is holding thousands and thousands of shipping containers, cars, lumber, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, another one is uh, the Strait of Malacca, which is the second busiest waterway uh, in the U.S. And this is between the Pacific and Indian basins. The Panama Canal, um, this is a whole story, but... But um, this, was a, this was Imperial America as we were wanting to do things and, and, and as we were wanting to avoid, as we were wanting to avoid having to go all the way down around South America to, for stuff from the Pacific to get the Atlantic or vice versa. And so <clears throat> essentially we uh, decided to build this canal and uh, killed a bunch of people and changed the ecology of Panama and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but uh, this was built in 1914 for an era where the ships were much smaller. So the Panama Canal is now struggling because as vessels get bigger and bigger, the biggest of the new big vessels can't fit in the Panama Canal. So, so, so important are, are some of these pinch points that people design the vessels to, to be constrained because of the constraints there. Hold on one sec, Willow. And then, um, and so this is a series of locks. So there's, so Panama is now struggling one because the big vessels can't get in there and are starting to go other, other paths. And so therefore Panama does not get the taxes of ships going through and climate change induced drought. And so a massive, so these locks are essentially you go in, flood it with water, and then the ship moves and then you go another thing and then you either lower the water or, or, or go up higher. Needs a lot of water. When this was designed a century ago, oh sure, tropics, lots of water, no problem. Now, water is a problem. And so that's also limiting capacity. So this is on the order of about 40 ships a day go through there. And then we have the Suez Canal, <clears throat> which was uh, uh, created um, even longer ago. Um, almost 200 years ago, uh, the design for it began. Um, and it, it goes through um, sort of the Middle East to, to Europe into the you know, Mediterranean in that area. Um, it has 12% of the world's trade. And when, uh, if you guys remember this during the pandemic, this one ship got stuck in there, which you wouldn't want to ever do this experiment, but since we did it, um, you could actually see what happened when we stopped allowing vessels to, to go through there. In other words, how dependent we are on these shipping channels. And that one 
that one event where, where the vessel was stuck and didn't allow uh, ships to go through it until it was freed um, cost almost $10 billion per day in terms of economic losses. Um, and, and this takes on the order of about 70 ships a day. Yeah, Will, you had a question. Yeah, so great question. So, so we could just cut a, 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 a um, river through the land, right? We could just make the ocean connect. And because all this stuff is, because this is the, the surface of the ocean and this is the surface of the ocean, it's not a problem, right? It would, it would, all, be, it would all just be water. But land has elevation. And so to do that, it's not just digging a trench. It's not just dr digging a, a channel. You know, right near, the o right near the coast, it would be digging a channel. But then as you start to go uphill, you have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually you'd be like, you know, skyscraper depth into the land. So what they chose to do was to essentially just make a channel of a constant depth, essentially. But it went uphill. And so therefore... You know, the water, if, if we just, you know, open, the, open the, um, the channel, like water would go in from the Pacific and water would go in from the Caribbean, I don't know, a mile, a few miles, something like that. And then it, then it would, you know, be like on a beach, right? It would, the land would come up. So what they did instead is they made, wall, they made walls in there and they create this area where you move into and, it, and it's at the elevation of the sea, and then once it's sealed off, it's called a lock, then you pump a bunch of water in and you float higher and higher and higher and higher. And at the, in the middle of Panama is a lake, in the middle of the thing. So, so basically they, they, they step up to the lake and then you go across the lake and then you do the reverse on the way out. So you go into the, the, the chamber and then they pump the water out and then you, you, know, you sink. And then when the floodgates or when the, the lock gates open, then you're 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 at sea level again. You know that kind. Of, I mean, there's, there's several steps, but I'm I'm simplifying it. But you get the idea. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, we also have these things called dead zones or hypoxic zones, and so these are areas where we have. Um, uh, uh, they're almost all in coastal waters, um, and they are close to land. They're where we don't have a lot of water movement, so the water can hang out uh, in, in place for, for an ex extended period of time. And we have a lot of runoff. So primarily this is driven by eutrophication, by, by um, nitrogen, phosphorus, other compounds that are leaching off of the land and causing algal blooms, so the, the, the growth of, of critters, and then those critters die, um, or at night they respire, and they suck out a lot of the oxygen. So rather than there being an oxygen-rich water with a lot of dissolved oxygen, it's relatively uh, oxygen poor. And so these areas are expanding by the year, but this is another really important management um, uh, situation. So this is leading to die off of seagrass beds and, and things of that nature. Uh, and and the, the most famous one for us in the U.S. is the one off of Louisiana, off the mouth of the Mississippi, and it's a, a, a dead zone where we have much lower abundance of, of fish and, and critters. Um, other important management geographies are the, are the, mid, is the midwater. So this is the pelagic realm we talked about. This is, a, this is um, important for a lot of fisheries. A lot of these, a lot of these critters hang out here uh, in the water column. Uh, a lot of the midwater looks like this. So again, no light and is dark. Um, and it leads to, we're, we, we'll talk about this later, but um, uh, leads to all kinds of funky, cool critters. This is a Vampyrotuthis. This is um, a, a funky critter that is normally in the black. Uh, and so his red color acts as camouflage because if there is any light, it, it, uh, red light doesn't go very far in the ocean. And this guy and other critters um, are sometimes part of this of the largest mass migration, daily migration on planet Earth. And so that is from the deep water 
to the shallower waters. And so that's what we're showing here. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a depth plot. And let me just, since uh, in future lectures we might look at more of these, just orient you. On the left-hand side, the top red line here is the, is the air. So the top red line is the surface of the ocean. And as we go down on the x-axis, we're going deeper in the water. Now normally when I show you an x-y plot, the lower left corner would be the zero. And as we go up, the numbers would get bigger, right? Go zero, 10, 20, 100, 50, what, you know, whatever. With these depth plots, we reverse, the, the typical convention is to reverse the, the y-axis because that makes more sense to us. We're, how many meters into the ocean are we going? So just, just realize that. When we do a depth plot, the zero is usually up on the, on the upper uh, left part of the graph, not the lower um, part of the graph. Okay, and so, so, so what we're looking at here is, and then the color that's being visualized is the amount of so-called backscattering. So we've sent out a sonar pulse, bloop, bloop, and when it hits something, it echoes and bounces back, and we pick that up as a detection. So the hotter the color, the more stuff. And so... What we see here, and, and then the, and not rather than land versus middle of the ocean, land, that's not what we're showing here. We're showing the same part of the ocean, but the x-axis here is time. So the x-axis here on the left, we're talking about, say, midnight. Then as we move right across this graph, we go to midday, bright sun. As we continue to move to the right, we get to the, the nighttime again. And what we see is, in the nighttime, there's a lot of stuff shallow. There's a lot of biomass very close to the, to the air. And then as the sun starts to come up, all, a lot of these, there's, there's, there's always some things up here, right? There's always some plot. But we see this very distinct pulse. This, this, this chunk of life moves down. These are squid. These are all kinds of things. And so what's happening is these, these critters really want to eat all that phytoplankton, that zooplankton, and all that food in that productive shallow area. But when they move in there, other things, the tuna will see them. And the tuna's like, I'm going to eat you, right? So they don't want to be eaten. So they're kind of hanging out when, when they're visible, you know, hiding when they're visible. And then when the sun goes down and it's easier for them to not be detected, they move up and feed. And this goes on every day of the year across all stretches of the ocean. And, and the general term for that is the deep scattering layer. Okay. So those are a couple examples. So, so that's a bit about um, uh, some terms for life, some terms for geography, some terms for some of our key treaties, um, et cetera. Um, are there other key management geographies you guys are wondering about or have been thinking about that I didn't touch on that you would like me to, to give a quick summary of? The Bermuda, the Bermuda Triangle. Ah, yes, the old Bermuda Triangle. How are we going to deal with that? Yes, yeah, so the supposed area where these these bombers disappeared a uh, uh, hundred some odd years ago and that supposedly all these mysterious forces align. Uh, yes, I do not know of any management implications for that. But, but good guess, but good guess. Others? Okay, all right. So with that, why don't we take a, a break and we'll come back and, and pick it up.